Good morning. Uh, welcome back to our Monday morning talks. I'm here with Mark this morning, and today we're talking about the man who was born blind. Yesterday, our sermon was in John chapter 9. It's pretty much the whole chapter. Yeah. Um, this story of the man who was born blind, um, Jesus runs into him outside the temple gate with his disciples, and, uh, and ultimately he heals him. There's a lot of conversation with the religious leaders. Hopefully you can watch or listen to the sermon from yesterday and have some more information on that. But we'll just kind of dig right in. Like what observations, questions, things did you see yesterday, Mark? I, uh, I love the sermon. And I think the setup <clears throat> from previous festival and the torches and Jesus talking about the light of the world. And then we go into this... Uh, situation where the man born blind is healed and I thought what you talked about with the eye doctor and what this miracle really meant was really eye-opening ha <laughs> uh, and anyway just you're so good at puns <laughs> yeah. by the way <laughs> how much of a miracle <laughs> how much a of a guy. yeah <laughs> it's just an amazing miracle I mean sometimes I think we read about these miracles oh yeah Jesus did another miracle but uh, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit more. Honestly, I didn't really even plan to like talk much about that um, going into yesterday. But like I had said in the sermon, I have a friend who I've actually become friends with through sports card collecting. And he comes down and uh, he's a retired eye doctor and he was here Thursday. My sermon was done. Um, But I just thought, hey. I'm preaching on a guy that was born blind and he's healed and I'm sitting here with a retired eye doctor like what does he think about this and so I didn't really get into like the scripture or anything with him but I really just kind of wanted to know like you know how big a deal really is that and is is it and and I do like the fact that we were able to emphasize through that conversation that just like gosh these miracles are not commonplace yeah this was not something that just I love the quote. I read it to you earlier. Um, You know, like whether it's a figure of speech or or whatever, um, but the the man born blind, he actually says uh, with his own words, and I'm trying to find the exact verse where he said it, but, you know, he just said, you know, never. It's verse 32. Yeah. Never since the world began. Has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? Someone born blind. Yeah. Like, that's a pretty <laughs> Yeah. That's a pretty serious statement there. Never in the entire world ever yeah. has this happened. Like, Jesus just did a big deal thing. And even like you said, I mean, a couple of chapters later, there's still kind of refers reeling and talking about this event happening. Yeah. So one of the guys I was reading, um, as I was studying, he actually said that a lot of theologians, a lot of scholars think this is like the central story of the book of John, even huh. uh, in, in the movement of John's gospel, like this is it. So hmm. do they see John as a <clears throat> chiastic thing? Is that where I don't know. I'll get that from. That'd be interesting to look into. So, uh, Anyway, the, the miracle stuff, uh, I think sometimes we underestimate. I mean, I think we think, eh, they were just country, country bumpkins back then. They are naive and all right. that. No, there's a lot of, you know, non-belief, skepticism sure. about that. And the, over the resurrection too, you know. I, I didn't, I didn't want to joke. I didn't want to make light of essential oils or anything like that yes, necessarily <laughs> but, but but i did but i did just want to point out that it's just no. like hey you if you are thinking about trying to explain this miracle away right you might as well forget yeah. it like yeah there's nothing there i mean this is yeah. this is miraculous so that's good you made a pretty strong statement and i've actually had to think about this if your life is not changed it's Essentially, is what you said. You're probably not following Jesus, you know. Yeah, and I think I agree with that. But I think there's some theology today that uh, all you have to do is believe Jesus, and that's all it takes. Right. 
So I don't know. I felt like yesterday's sermon really I I kind of I kind of emphasized that direction. You know, cuz with this series, the whole series is about change. The whole series is about life change, right. but I think we I think we tend to we you know, we emphasize different parts of change. We emphasize emphasize different changes in our lives and I think sometimes as Christians, we make the mistake of of emphasizing conversion as an event. Yeah. And then instead of a process under emphasizing the change that continues, you yeah. know, and it's just like, no, there's you know, you read James, <clears throat> you know, James pr- pretty well emphasizes throughout his book this act of becoming holy and like, you know, this is that's I wanted to take some time to emphasize for our our church, like, because we we harp on these these Pharisees. We talk about how bad of people they were, but they're really not that bad, and they're <laughs> comparable to us. You know, I talked about that some yesterday, but really, like the whole the whole thing I was trying to get at is just like, man, the change doesn't stop. Like, if you are following Jesus, that's the whole that that is. That is the us I'm under emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit then. Yeah. It's under emphasizing the role of scripture in our lives, like the Holy Spirit's power and him dwelling in us, like the whole value of that is that he continues to transform. Transform. Yeah. You know, yeah. he continues to convict. And I've I've had people actually tell me people really can't change. You know, I mean, they, and there's kind of some cynicism about that. But you just look at people's life through time. I mean, as we age, we change, you know, and not just physically, but uh, we change attitudes and <clears throat> perspectives and things like that. But there's a lot of cynicism about people can't really change. Yeah. Uh, so I, th- I, I thought do, that was a good point. I mean, I, yeah. And there, there's a lot there. I mean, obviously, there are things about us that I think maybe maybe don't change, you know, there are things that make us unique and, you know, like there's a reason I'm me and you're you. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, (laughs) For who? Uh, But, but, but anyway, like I, to think that like I haven't changed, you know, uh, it's good to be able to sit and take stock of that. Like how and how much. Yeah. And like what's changing right now. You know, how do I, how do I think I'm going to look different a year from now? You know, what, what, where is he working in my life at the moment? And well, these testimonies we've heard, every one of them is, oh, they're a different person today than they were at one time. Sure. So, uh, well, and that's what I appreciated about Mindy's testimony yesterday Yeah. with this sermon specifically was the, the fact that she kind of pointed out that it's like, you know, there wasn't really like one event Right. In her conversion experience or in her following Jesus story. But it was a series of things over a, you know, a certain period of time Mm -hmm. that all kind of played a role, a significant role in it. And so it took it, her conversion took place over time. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a, a, you know, road to Damascus type of of thing. So anyway, yeah. I'm going to talk about that next week a little bit. So. Little commercial for. Nicodemus. I told Mark Nicodemus like, because of these conversations. Now uh, I'm probably going to be engaged in his sermon to a different level next week, <laughs> uh, or the you know next Sunday, and I'm super looking forward to having this conversation Monday. Oh, you're going to stay awake. Yeah, good. yeah, good. Glad to hear it. Okay, uh, I didn't get the exact quote, but Warren Wearsby, you mentioned something, and uh, it's something about. It's in reference to the blindness, the blind metaphor, you know, the blind man actually sees and these Pharisees or religious leaders are actually the blind ones. And and Wiersbe said something about some think they have all the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, that jumped out at me. Um, And I also have been reading a book that talked about intelligent, the more intelligent you are, the easier it is to self-deceive yourself. Mm. And I thought, man, that was kind of... And these religious leaders are not dummies. I mean, no. they're, they're, they're intelligent, all that. 
but uh, because they were more intelligent, more religious, they didn't want to listen to this blind man. I mean, yeah, they're, it all plays together because the conversation we were just having, like, it almost feels like the sin, the great sin of the Pharisees is they stopped changing. You know, like they, they got to the place of, the, of arrogance really yeah. in, in religion that was just like, we're, we've arrived. They have a corner on the truth. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. so I'll, I'll read the quote you were talking about. So okay. the Wearsby quote was, and this was from his commentary on, on John 9. And I just thought it was a good summary um, of that whole final conversation that, that Jesus is having with with the blind man after he returns Mm -hmm. kind of, and you know, the Pharisees are still present. They kind of overhear and they're, they make themselves part of the conversation too. But anyway, Wearsby just said the same sun that brings beauty out of the seeds also exposes the vermin hiding under the rocks. The religious leaders were blind and would not admit it. Therefore the light of truth only made them blinder. The beggar admitted his need, and he received both physical sight and spiritual sight. No one is so blind as he who will not see. The one who thinks he has all truth, That's it. and there is nothing more for him to learn. Yeah. I have down here, not teachable. Mm. When we get to that point, it's over. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, no, like, probably the most... Probably the most feedback I even get from people as a preacher, it, I never have conversations with people about my sermons where they just go, man, you knocked it out of the park today. You are so smart. <laughs> you know, like it's never, it's never kind of one of those things where it's just like, oh, your, your biblical knowledge is so that, you know, it's never that. Usually it like when I, when people really engage a sermon or, I feel like it's usually the conversation of like, man, I just really appreciated your heart or I really appreciated yeah. your transparency or, yeah. you know, like pe- people and, and honestly, God like value humility and this, this place of just like, man, I don't, I haven't figured it all out. I'm, I'm still on this journey and you know, like there's, but the, it seems like that's Wearsby's just kind of pointing out that it's like, man, that's where the Pharisees were. They were kind of at this place that it was just like, yeah, we have though. <laughs> we kind of have figured yeah. it out. And everybody else had, like, they talk down to this guy so much. Yeah. It's in their conversation, you know, and, and yeah. even in kicking him out, they're just like, how, you know, I love the, the conversation in there where that I don't love it, but I mean, it's what they're talking down to him. They just say, you a sinner? are going to teach us. Yep. Like, yeah, who so, do you think you are? Yeah. And it's like, man, if you ever get to the point that you're saying to someone, who do you think you are? You might, you might want to take a step back and go, who am I? <laughs> you know? Um, cause that's, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, I, my, uh, the most impactful professor in my life was Bob Lowry, who some of our listeners would know. And he said the number one principle of interpretation one of the number one principle of, you know, Bible study is humility, mm. you know, and I've always remembered that and I've always had in the back of my mind, I may come to a conclusion, but I always have in the back of my mind, I may be wrong, you know, in fact, I'm pretty sure I probably am wrong on some of my yeah. theological understandings. We all are. We, you and I have talked about this before. Like I have friends in ministry <clears throat> that I think, um, you know, some of the difference between, between, between us at times, like I just, I've just I've always kind of had this mindset that like I reserve the right to change my mind. Yeah. Like that's my re- approach to the word. That's yeah. a, my approach to my opinions Yeah, on things. Like I, I'm going to, this is where I'm, I'm at today. Yeah. But changed lives. Yeah. Like i yeah. this is may not be where I am a year from now, you know, but yeah. I have, fr- I have friends and I know other people that would say, no, I've made my mind up and you know, that will even kind of dig their heels in and say, yeah. this is where you need to be. And yeah. it's just like, uh, careful. 
because <laughs> well growth implies change <clears throat> yeah you know when the baby's growing they're changing and if we're growing in christ we're going to change and it includes changing our minds on mm-hmm. some things so uh, one other question i had is banished he was banished from the synagogue mm. sounded like a big deal could you expound the, on that a little bit more it's that <clears throat> whole conversation actually the the banishment from the synagogue is what makes his parents yeah key characters in the story you know because otherwise they're just kind of they're just kind of there they're just a part of what's going on you know and but really what you know they've they've kind of been made the bad guys in this story you know i've heard i've heard that approach to this text that like man these parents are so weak yeah to just to just go you know what we're not gonna we're not gonna speak for our son He's a grown man. You talk to him. And because John puts that little, yeah, he puts that little description in there, that little indicator where he just says, you know, that they feared the Jews for the Jews had already agreed. If anyone would confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Yeah. You know, and so that was the, that was a great fear. And, and really like in reading and pointing it out, like, I think it's a bigger conversation. Um, when you think, when you look at the purpose for John writing and who he was writing to, his gospel is so different from the other gospels. Yeah, you got to remember the synoptics. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written you within within a generation of Jesus dying. Yeah, like fifty A.D. They're all within that yeah. first fifty years. So they're pre they're they're writing to people who saw Jesus. A new Jesus. Mm -hmm. John is writing a generation later, really. You know, John's writing a good almost 35, 40 years after the synoptics. And so John's writing to people who never saw Jesus, but they're actually being persecuted for their belief. And that that was kind of what was happening. Like the John's crowd were, were, they weren't being persecuted even by the Jews because they weren't Jews. Yeah, they were this yeah. offshoot, you know, who believed in the Messiah and they were being kicked out of their synagogues. And and the big deal there is and that's what's going on with this family and with the blind man. When you were kicked out of your synagogue, I mean, you've got to imagine it. I, I really as a believer, the best. The, I mean, it really is kind of the same thing. If you were kicked out of your church. Particularly, like, l- let's look at it in our context. Like, you live in Moequa, <laughs> and you get kicked out of your church, like, the whole, uh, you're, like, blacklisted. Yeah, yeah, right. That's your community. Yeah. That's yeah. your, for me, getting kicked out of my church would be so devastating because the church in so many ways has become my family. Like, for me to lose my spiritual family, to lose my seat yeah. in the church, to lose my, you know, identity in that, like that, that would literally be devastating to me. And, yeah. and so I, that was a big, big, big deal. And, and it's more of the it, like difficulty with the Pharisees there is it's just like, who, who are these guys that like, that's kind of what they're doing, you know, but, but you just have to remember like, man, they were, they weren't awful people they just they didn't have all, all of what we have <laughs> that's all the knowledge we have after the fact in hindsight to uh, yeah well their motives were to protect the faith mm-hmm. and jesus was a threat to the faith and uh, we would do the same thing today uh so my question with this whole story <clears throat> would be you know with some of the other ones we've said like did they go on we have we don't always have an indication with people that encountered jesus did they leave this encounter a believer? Mm-hmm. We know that the blind man did like we're, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. his life is, but my question with him is, so did his parents stay? Yeah. Cause he's out. It doesn't say he's been kicked out. Yeah. They did like, so did they stay in their synagogue yeah. or did they support and follow their son? Like, yeah. And that's kind of what I indicated. Like this dude, he didn't just lose his, his church family he potentially lost his family yeah to follow point. jesus like he potentially walked away from his parents here not on purpose but they kind of walked away from him yeah you know like they 
they may have sort of disowned him here to keep their seat in their church. I don't, I don't know. And that's true today. People lost family because they committed to Christ in the world, you know, so. Anyway, that's, it was a great sermon. I thought uh, I would encourage you to to watch it if you weren't there. And Yeah. Looking forward to next Sunday. Yeah, I'm, lo- I'm loving the series. It is a good series. Um, really good. And so next week we'll conclude it with Nicodemus. Very good. All right, have a good week.